afternoon. As I often tell you, I have just as much trouble, as, or probably more, than many of you with my computer. So I just gave this lecture, and I'm going to do it again. Um, today we're going to discuss the age of classical Greece, which is probably the epoch of Greece that you've heard of or that you've heard most about. It generally involves the unbelievable progress in culture and other dynamics that Athenian Greece made after the Persian Wars for about 40 to 60 years afterwards, leading up to what we call the Peloponnesian War, which is a civil war between Athens and Sparta. As we begin, um, I just want to remind you that we had some indication of an opening or democratization of Athenian society before the Persian Wars. Remember, we talked about ostracism, um, the hoplites clamored to get more power in the culture because they sacrificed themselves in war. Um, so quite slowly, that little aristocratic elite was expanding, but not much. Um, what we see after the Persian Wars immediately in one of the reasons they won is because of this group called the Dalian League, which was a league primarily of um, Athenian city-states or poli that were on the Aegean that kept up the watch. Their leader was a guy named Caimon, uh, C-I-M-O-N, and I think, believe it's pronounced Caimon, um, who watched out against Persia, also kept a lookout against Sparta, um, but he also used that league, even though it was supposed to be a united defense league, to punish little city-states, A, that he could, B, that he didn't like the way they were working, C, he collected more monies from them. Um, and so people started to want to leave the Delian League, uh, uh, um, from which Athens was the sole support. So uh, key, Athens controlled Cayman and controlled their funds and their behavior, and most of the surrounding areas of Athens then began to resent the Delian League under Cayman's leadership. So this is complicated because what's going to happen is this is going to occur, this increasing disaffection about subjects surrounding Athens um, who uh, were increasingly frustrated with Cayman and his outreach to these other city-states. And even the in as the democratization inside Athens and new experimental thinking and culture was going on inside Athens, there was this sort of little undercurrent of hostility from all the city-states that were being taxed and asked to contribute more and more to uh, the Navy and the Dalian League. Now, there's also going to be a little undercurrent of unrest in Athens itself, but that we will discuss. Okay, now, um, again, I told you just now that reforms, political reforms, and opening up of Athenian society was, in fact, occurring before um, or as some people call it an actual opening up of democratic values and democracy inside of Athens was going on even before the Persian Wars, such as the little um, ostracism, you know, the voting with lots, I'm sorry, not with lots, but with the shards, etc. One of the things that had um, taken place was, in fact, the voting of lots. You know, when you just put, uh, like, a paper in a paper bag or the short stick, the long stick. Um, and the only position amongst the aristocracy that was not decided by lot was something called the strategos, the major general the generals um, who would protect the integrity of Athens. That might be what we call the um, commander-in-chief today. Nevertheless, the voting for the strategos was the only thing that was, uh, the only position, I should say, that uh, was done by traditional voting, the office of the strategos or the general. And that they would hold that uh, office only every year, uh, 
every year. They would rotate, not rotate, but be elected. Why? Because a general can bring with him military power and use that military power to form a coup d'etat, to stay in power, any number of things. Um, but because it was such a highly privileged um, uh, position, that was the most coveted position in Athens, and many of the aristocratic leaders wanted to be general or strategos. Uh, one of them, of course, was Cayman, uh, as we talked about, but, it's, but um, he was antagonizing and alienating most people, and the mood in Athens was changing. How was it changing? Well, first of all, just like the hoplites earlier in ancient Greece, uh, the rowers of the trireme, remember the trireme? You can see a picture on page 93 or whatever, you know, page in your book. You could see their double rows just on one side of something like 60 rowers. And if you imagine our fleet of 200 plus naval triremes um, in this naval society or sea power, bringing back that word thalassocracy, right, the sea power, um, but they were getting pretty frustrated. They had gone out and fought and beat the Persians and yet had no power. They were being treated like uh, uh, la like uh, laborers or slaves. They had no property. They had no ability to um, take part in government. And it clearly, um, even the aristocracy knew they had to do something. Why? Because they're the brawn. There are many more of them than there are the aristocracy. Um, and so... Um, and we know the history in Athens that the hoplites, sort of in the same position earlier, uh, clamored for their own role in government and eventually got citizenship, or at least were given monies enough that they could buy their way in to land holding and therefore participate as a citizen within the polis. Um, now these rowers, of the trireme are called, or of the navy, are called thetes, T-H-E-T-E-S, but pronounced thetes. They were a lower class of free men, and they were the rowers, but they were the backbone of the Athenian fleet. Um, the individual from the aristocracy who championed their cause was a guy named Pericles. He was from an aristocratic, very well-known family, and he made getting citizenship and voting rights for the Thetes his uh, platform or his, um, you know, campaign slogan, if you will. Um, he also advocated a foreign policy to secure peace, not war, so the Thetes wouldn't have to um, continued to only train for war. And one of the things he did was, um, was suggest cooperation with Sparta as opposed to constant tension. Now, in 462-461 BCE, Pericles, therefore, was um, elected strategos, and immediately, remember he only has about a year, he used his position to secure the ostracism you know, the banishment or outing, uh, get ridding, getting rid of his rival, came on. Then he pushed through a lot of different reforms quite quickly uh, that gave every Athenian citizen the right to propose and amend legislation, um, not just to vote yes, or yay or nay, or up or down in the citizens' assembly. Um, he even paid, including for the uh, Thetes uh, for a daily wage for attendance in the assembly. Of course, this made it easier for the poor citizens to participate in the assembly and in the courts of justice. Now, it was through these kinds of measures and through the efforts that Pericles made uh, that Pericles becomes a dominant force in politics. And also, of course, who else? The men of modest means, the Thetes, the lower classes. Um, and they became very loyal, of course, to Pericles, who had made their increasing powerfulness um, possible. Now, Pericles did something else. 
A, he had a populist agenda, in which most popular people seem to uh, cl clamor for. You know, he was popular, charismatic, etc. But he also did uh, a whole ambitious scheme of building public buildings, lots of festivals honoring the gods, especially Athena. Um, he and many of his uh, friendly aristocratic, you know, power holders became patrons of the arts, that is theater, poetry, etc. cetera. Um, they attracted as many great minds from Miletus and elsewhere um, as they could to get involved in writing, the sciences again, and all that just promoted, again, Athenian sense of superiority of the other uh, city-states in the area, and that allowed um, him to be re-elected as Strategos for three decades, 30 years. Now, during this time, after the Persian War, therefore, Athens flourished. Um, at the same time, however, what it's going to do is alienate the other city-states in the Greek world by what was the worst thing you could do? Uh, hubris, arrogance, and, of course, it's aggression. Okay, that's the introduction. Let me go now to Athens as, uh, you know, Athenian theater. Let's just talk about that. As a mirror to... Um, political and social details and ideals of that polis. Um, we'll just use um, the culture and art of every society is influenced by its politics and economy. In other words, Shakespeare of the 1500s um, reflects the problems of the kings and the queens and uh, the trade with Italy and their prejudices, etc. And it's exactly the same with Athens. Athens the um, culture of Athens, meaning the theater, the literature, the language, all reflects uh, the political and um, economy of the culture. Um, and so if we think about the way that democratic institutions infiltrated these arts, we could learn something about the culture or, you know, sort of learn from the bottom up. Let's take the culture and see what we can glean about the uh, country during that time. Okay, so let's focus on two areas here. One will be drama, theater, and the other will be philosophy. Uh, drama appears to be more democratic than any other art form. Why? Because you really can't do it alone. You need a group to perform it. Uh, it it needs a group to work together. So a democracy also can be strong when people work together. It's also much more difficult to put down theater or an individual writing, working, creating theater if there's a, only an individual. It's much harder if it's a group of people. So democracy can be strong, we know, when people work together. And theater is only theater, really, when many people work together. Uh, such as writers of the play, producers of the play, actors, chorus of singers, um, dancers in ancient Greek theater. Um, and that is exactly what happens for one of the first times in history in Athenian democracy of this particular period. Um, there's drama, which means, and then we can break that down into tragedy, uh, and there's also comedy. Um, so the tragedies are usually set in the distant past, uh, and they deal with justice, injustice, issues of violence. Why are they usually not set in the present? Because they don't want to take the risk of intimidating or excoriating too much the powers that be. Um, and uh, they want to sort of be careful. And comedy uh, might be like SNL today. It always sends up, you sometimes don't even know what their position is, but the election, the senators, the president, whomever. So comedy in some ways is harder to write, but more powerful or satire, what you will. Um, and that's, you know, um, The Daily Show on John Oliver, 
or with John Oliver or what have you. And the comedy, one of the greatest comedy writers in ancient Greece was a guy named Aristophanes. And he was a comic playwright. He wrote about issues of his day. Um, and he wrote something called The Clouds. And there were many, many more. And you can read in your book about um, literature and theater. I'm not going to go through all that today. Oh, and by the way, in the proscenium, in the theaters that are built, they are um, brilliance in architecture. Remember, there are no microphones or anything. So they built those outdoor stages where you can hear from one end to the theater. It's quite extraordinary, and you can see pictures of those. It, it's just amazing how they did that. Now, and of course, their art and architecture, the realism of the human body, especially idealizing the Thetis or the hoplites. Uh, and needless to say, that is going to be a precursor of Michelangelo's David. If you look on page 99, the sculpture, the architecture, the temples, um, etc. But the other area I really want to focus on now and talk about that emerged in uh, the more open society of Athenian culture after the Persian Wars, Periclean Athens, was philosophy. And if you think about Socrates, Socrates is urging people to question authority and the sources of authority. This is when he functions. Um, so he is a creature of an opening society. He urges people to use reason in order to... Um, upend traditional wisdom or superstition. And even Socrates, and we'll find that he has limits to this. But that's, in general, his attempt. Uh, we do know, of course, that Socrates is eventually put on trial and put to get death, even by his own citizens. So they found... Um, so we know, then, that um, Socrates made the powers that be uncomfortable enough to do that. We'll talk in detail about how that happens in a way. But in a way, Socrates then for um, exemplifies um, the idea of democracy, the opening of democracy, and its success in a way as well as its failure. Um, democracy and its limitations. Um, I just want to say that, that a couple things before I stop for today and before I get on to um, the conclusion of the Periclean Athenian state and go on to the Peloponnesian War, which is really a civil war now between um, Sparta and Athens. At any rate, Athens was not the only city to produce great works of art during this period, but of course, classical Greek culture is dominated by Athenian democracy and one of the festivals is Dionysia. It was a spring festival to Dionysus, a celebration of Athenian democratic ideals and Athenian exceptionalism, why they're so great. What does that sound like? That sounds like what you hear today about American exceptionalism, America being the beacon on the hill, um, the, the culture that everyone looks up to. Um, Another writer that you probably will hear about was Aeschylus, Sophocles, Aristophanes. These are all um, these are all symbols, theatrical symbols, and poets of Periclean society. Um, now, let me see if there's anything else I want to do. Oh. The other thing I just want to mention is that many of the cultural um, stories that are told in theater and comedy, the backgrounds are about uh, the epics of Homer, which, as I mentioned, uh, take place in that area. And um, take place in that area of Athens in the Athenian zone. Um, and... Um, and you will see that they, Orestes, Homer, Clytemnestra, all of the um, heroic people in Homer's Odyssey, 
um, might be included, including Agamemnon. These are fabulous stories, and unfortunately, we just don't have the time to go into each of them. Um, Herodotus, I just want to mention one more thing. The philosophers, we had theater, we have art, we have sculpture, uh, philosophy, and also history. Herodotus, I mentioned to you, um, created really a new science that Athens wanted to nurture, which is writing the story, not making it up, but writing it uh, simultaneously as they were living it. And his younger contemporary, Thucydides, is also going to use his time in exile to write about, um, um, even though he was critical, of the history of the war between Athens and Sparta, which we will get to uh, next in uh, a ne our next recording. Thank you.